What's going on? Did I lose? Did I lose you guys or do I have you guys? Okay, I got you guys back. I don't know what happened there. We had some internet hiccups or something, but we're back. Um, this is looking at the port of Long Beach in Los Angeles. And this mess has only gotten worse. I'm counting over 40 ships here. And actually closer to 50. I mean, I'm not even counting everything going on in here. I'm just counting what's going on in the parking lot. And I want to also, I've been watching the port of Savannah, Georgia on the other coast. And now we're up to 30 ships waiting here. So this parking lot continues to get worse week in and week out. And I saw this article today. The largest, let's make sure we can see. Okay, we're going to shrink me. Let's move me down here. The largest port in the U.S. hit a new ship backlog record every day last week as 65 massive container boats float off the California coast. Now, this is a few days old. This was released on the 20th. All right, and I want to... I want to zoom in on this picture because look at this picture. That is, you know, let's move me again. The Pacific parking lot. Look at all those ships just sitting there burning through money, waiting to unload. Those ships could be on their way back to China right now making more money, but they're not. They're sitting there waiting. Um, the situation going on at U.S. ports is very real, folks, and it's getting worse. And there was some numbers in here. The average wait time is now eight and a half days, I believe it was, and it's about two and a half days longer than at the same time last month. And again, this is a few days old, so things are getting worse by the day. And I want to read you a quote that was in here at the very end. And this is a quote from Douglas Kent. Executive Vice President of Strategy and Alliances at the Association for Supply Chain Management. He writes, one more disruption could send it, the supply chain, into complete chaos. One more disruption could send it into complete chaos. So whatever is going on in the supply chain, um, there is no room for error. There is zero room for error right now. So I don't know. What that means, I don't know. Can we stand if oil suddenly goes to ninety or hundred dollars a barrel? If the Iranians start acting up again, um, if another ship blocks the Suez Canal, who knows? Um, but there's not a lot of wiggle room in the supply chain right now. Not a lot. So, Mike, your comment about that kind of spurred that discussion. One more thing before we move on from China, um, I do want to mention this: Evergrande stays silent on its eighty-three million dollar bond interest payment. Okay, they had an $83 million coupon was due today. A uh, little bit of bond lingo. If you hear coupon, coupon think interest. Okay, if you hear coupon rate, that's the interest rate. So they had an $83 million bond payment due, and that was only the coupon on those bonds. That was only interest. That was not reducing their debt by one penny. That was just to maintain their debt where it is. The deadline was yesterday. They missed it. Now they're in their 30-day grace period. They have not officially defaulted until 30 days after. So... I guess some people were kind of tricked into thinking Evergrande says they can make their payment, thinking the payment was going to happen that day. It didn't. All right. So they've got 30 days. So this story is going to go on for quite a while. Does anyone else think this is from uh, Carlitos thinks, does anyone else think that it's suspect that everyone's predicting us dollar inflation due to money injections? And now with this China debacle, deflation is being predicted. Do they cancel each other out? LOL. Carlito, that isn't, Excellent uh, comment. I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, is enough wealth about to be destroyed in China? And will that translate into a more powerful dollar here in the U.S. and less inflation? I don't know. I mean, we're, we're dealing with two massive market events, right? The inflation caused by the single largest printing of money in history on top of what looks like the second largest, possibly the largest real estate collapse in history. All right, those two things are happening simultaneously. And we're talking about such large numbers and such complex issues that are happening on opposite sides of the Pacific Ocean. I don't know. This, 
I, I want to be upfront about my own limitations with you guys here. I don't know how that goes. And guys, if you've got more wrinkles in your brain than me and you want to weigh in on that, I would love to hear it. But I can tell you, I've started raising cash. And I spent the whole first half of this year getting out of cash. And now I have adjusted my strategy to where I'm raising cash and I am ready to go on a shopping spree should discounts arise. So not again, not financial advice, not investment advice. I'm only communicating what I'm doing. And I think there's enough of a chance of some kind of major market event downward that I'm getting some money ready, some dry, dry powder ready to rock. So uh, Carlitos, excellent comment. Thank you for that. Guys, the comments today are outstanding. You guys are awesome. All right. This is this is great. The, I love my follow. You guys are awesome. These are not dummies that follow this channel. You guys, these are very well nuanced, very well thought out comments today. So keep them coming, guys. This is great. All right, moving on. Uh, where was I? I got to this one. Okay, this topic, since we just did the topic of the, uh, the shipping situation. I mentioned a couple of videos again how there was a lot of business owners in the United States were holding their breath waiting for the expanded unemployment benefits to expire. And that date has come and gone. And I'm starting to see a lot of stuff about this that people are still not going back to work. That's a problem for the inflation story. All right, Carlitos, we're back on the inflation story here. Um, because there is... 11 million job openings in this country. And those job openings are having real effect, real impact on GDP. All right. There are, there are businesses that are doing less business right now because they can't get help. Restaurants are closing. Bars are closing. They're selling fewer drinks because they can't get enough bartenders to make the drinks. Right. So people are waiting longer. Seriously, folks, this is having real effect on the amount of money these businesses are making. And I think the reason why we haven't seen wage growth this year, like we should have, like inflation has would say, is because of these expanded unemployment benefits. However, those benefits expired 24 days ago now. And we're still not seeing a surge in hiring. And this article is saying it, that there is still no evidence. And we're still seeing weekly jobless claims are coming in hotter than expected. People aren't going back to work, folks. And the, what that means is those businesses, those 11 million job openings, you've got to pay more. They, wages have to rise. If people are not willing to trade their time for what you're offering, the price has to go up. All right. And salary, wages, hourly rates is a negotiation. It is, a, it is the price of labor and the price of everything else went up. So the price of labor has to rise commensurate with that. Folks, the inflation is going to get worse because the wages have to rise. Now, to Carlito's point from before, does that mean that, you know, the story going on in China, does that offset it? Again, I don't know. And that's why I said this is such a complex and convoluted equation. There are so many variables. But this one is another check in the inflation box because this story of job openings and wage pressure isn't going away anytime soon. People need higher wages to go back to work. People have spent all this time at home and the price of childcare has gone up so much, right? I mean, job it's almost $2,000 a month to have your kid taken care of where I am. If the job doesn't pay $2,000 a month, guess what? It makes better economic sense to stay home and take care of the kid yourself. So these, these low-wage jobs, if, if you have to make it worth people's while. That's all I'm saying. And people making money isn't a bad thing. I don't, I don't want to make it seem like I want people to make less money. I don't. But from an inflation standpoint, from an economic standpoint, if wages rise and there is no commensurate increase in productivity, that is inflationary. Okay, That means that the business's final price has to rise, that the price of the finished product or service has to rise in order for the businessman to maintain his margins. Or his margins get compressed and the business doesn't make as much money. Either way, wage increases without an increase in productivity is not necessarily good for the economy. Keep that in mind. Okay, moving on. There's another thing I wanted to talk about. Um, keep your eye on these interest rates, folks. Wow, 10-year treasury went to 1.45 today. That came out of nowhere. I mean, we were in the 1.3s, you know, and all of a sudden we had this spike yesterday, 
Um, I don't know if this is taper talk. I don't know if this is something to do with China. I mean, you would think the situation in China, a flight to safety, would drive bond prices up and yields down. Something is going on in the bond market right now. And this is, this is important. Keep your eye on this. I don't know if this is people starting to maybe hedge just a little bit about the debt ceiling, which, by the way, Economic Ninja did a video today about the debt ceiling. It was excellent. Folks, I want you to get a clothespin, and I want you to put it over your nose for the next month because there is going to be so much horse manure flung back and forth in Washington, D.C. about the debt ceiling and all the chicken littling and, oh, my God, these people are crazy. They want us to default on our debt and this and that and, and all the grandstanding. And then the other people will be saying, oh, they want to spend us into oblivion and mortgage and our children. All right, they're going to raise it, folks. The debt ceiling is going to get raised or it's going to get suspended again. It's going to happen. All right. I, I'm not going to say it's. Look, I'll say there is a non zero chance that they don't raise the debt ceiling. What do I mean by non zero? Forgive the engineer speak, okay? I'm, I'm saying there is a non zero chance. Just like there is a non zero chance that a meteor crashes through my ceiling in the next 10 seconds, hits me in the head, and kills me while I'm live streaming. All right? And of course, after the crack of thunder that happened while I was recording yesterday, maybe I shouldn't talk like that. But. It doesn't mean, look, a meteor is not going to come through my ceiling and kill me in the next 10 seconds. But I can't say there's a 0% chance of it. There is a non-zero. Like, it's so infinitesimal that it's not even really worth talking about. So maybe some of that is going on here. Maybe this non-zero percent chance of the debt ceiling not getting raised and the U.S. government defaulting on its debt, maybe that's what we're seeing with this spike in, in yields. Um. But watch this, because I think, let's look at a one-year chart in yields. Look, we've been coming up for a while here, and I think we need to keep our eye on this, because there is some serious movement coming in the bond market. And I, I want to bring up these charts here. This is the Treasury General account, and Uncle Sam, Aunt Janet, has been spending down the money in the Treasury General account. This is all the money that was printed and borrowed last year. So while they've been spending down all of last year's easy monopoly money, they have not been issuing any new treasury bonds or any new T-bills, right? So the supply of bonds has been limited this year. And we know what that's resulted in. The supply of bonds being limited has resulted in this, the reverse repo crisis, right? And reverse repos peaked this week at $1.35 trillion. Oh, my God. Now, we've got the end of the quarter coming up. So at the end of September, you're going to see a huge spike in reverse repos, a big one, just like we saw here at the end of June. We may even come close to that two trillion mark, but I think that's going to be the end of it. I think that's going to be the end of the reverse repo story, because when this number, when the Treasury General account gets to zero, Uncle Sam and Janet out of money. That's when they raise the debt ceiling. They'll wait till that gets close to zero, then they'll do it. All right. Now, once that debt ceiling gets raised, that's when the floodgates are open. That's when the new bonds start hitting the market like crazy. All right. And when that happens, the reverse repo problem goes away because now there is more than enough collateral on the market. Now there are all these bonds because they're going to instantly sell hundreds of billions, maybe not instantly, but over the course of months, they're going to be selling a lot of bonds. All right. So think high level here, supply and demand. What happens to the price of something when the supply increases, but the demand stays the same? The price goes down. And remember with bonds, prices and yields are inversely correlated. So when the debt ceiling gets raised and when Aunt Janet starts selling more treasury bonds, it's going to cause yields to go up. All right. It has to happen. Yields are going to go up at the end of this year when they raise the, the debt ceiling. Further adding to that is the apparent taper that the Federal Reserve is talking about. And if you think they're kidding about the taper, they're, the Fed governors are selling their own stocks right now. All right, so take that seriously. If they're selling their own stocks, it means they're serious. I think it's a joke that they're allowed to trade in and out of positions when they're printing money, destroying our savings and looting, looting our bank accounts, and then they're getting rich off it. My God, if, if ever there was a time for pitchforks and torches. 
But anyway, sorry. I, I digress. But what I'm saying is you have all this new supply when Aunt Janet is finally allowed to borrow again. At the same time, you have a taper. You have the single biggest buyer of bonds, the Federal Reserve, start slowing their asset purchases. So now you've got new supply and less demand. All right. Bond yields are going higher through the end of this year. How high, I don't know. All right. But if they get too high too fast, the market will panic. That's what happened in, was it December of 2018, the Christmas Eve sell-off. And that's when the Fed really quickly lowered interest rates. And that's what started the beginnings of a liquidity crisis. And I want to expand this chart real quick because I'm talking about, let's do a one-year chart here. All right. Make sure you guys can see. Oh, my melon is in the way. Get me out of the way here. Put me over here. So you can see we're back on an upward trajectory here, but I want to zoom way, way out in this chart. Way, way out. All the way back to the 1960s. All right. Now what you're seeing in this chart here and here, let's get me out of the way again. All right. You can see the inflation of the 1970s. Really, you can see it starting around 1971. And then you see that massive mountain in the middle of the chart, right? There's Paul Volcker and his ridiculous rate hikes, but he did contain the inflation. At least he brought it down to the Fed's 2% target. And ever since Volcker and his 20%, we have been on this downward trajectory. There have been bumps up and downs as the various economic crises and phenomenon over the years have played out. But look at this trend since 1981. Interest rates have been going down, 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 down. 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 So here we are now. Negative interest rates are coming, folks. In the short term, in the short term rates are going higher. Okay? I can tell you that. Supply and demand with what's about to happen in the bond market with all the new treasuries that are going to get issued and with the Fed buying fewer of them. In the short term, rates are going higher. And at some point, those higher rates are going to cause a problem because the United States is debt addicted. All right, we, ha we have too much debt in this country, and I'm not talking about the national, government, the national debt. I'm not talking about credit cards. I'm talking about all of it. All right, Individual household mortgages, business loans, collateralized loan obligations, commercial mortgage-backed securities. My God, who is paying to keep the lights on and the fountains running in all the malls where nobody's shopping right now? What is going on in the commercial MBS market? Like, I, I spent all week talking about China and what a joke their real estate market is. Go visit a mall if you can stand to and just look around and say, my God, what's paying for all this? Well, that has something to do with whatever's going on in the CMBS market. All right, so there's going to be some kind of a liquidity crisis. And again, the Fed has already established their standing repo facility to kind of get out in front of the next liquidity crisis when it happens. So we're going to come up. These interest rates down here, they're going to start coming up. They're going to start coming up. And somewhere between 2 and 3%, mark my words, and this may happen in 2022, but somewhere between 2 and 3%, markets are going to freak out Liquidity is going to dry up. Lending is going to dry up. There's going to be a big spike in the repos. And the Fed is going to resume its QE. And negative interest rates will be coming. That, that's my macro prediction for the next year, year and a half. All right. I think that'll happen sometime in the next two years. But in the short term, rates are going higher. Okay. And unfortunately, that is bad news for my favorite of the shiny metals, silver. This technical chart wasn't working before. It's still not working. But, oh, my goodness, the silver chart is just horrendous. What a terrible year silver has had. Um, and, folks, I have bad news. It broke below support. And with interest rates on the rise, I don't see a lot of good things happening in precious metals anytime soon. Um, but I did mention how I am raising cash and how I'm waiting for a shopping spree, waiting for things to go on sale. All right. Generational lows in silver is something I'm looking at as an opportunity. Physical silver. I'm done trading derivatives with silver. 
for the foreseeable future. Because I just I can't sit there in options and then watch these price smashes happen and watch my position evaporate just in these totally rigged markets. But in the short term, it looks like there's more pain ahead for silver and gold. Now, I've been so wrong about silver, maybe that maybe me getting bearish on precious metals is the bull flags or the bull signal you've been waiting for. I don't know. Hopefully. But uh you, I've been so wrong about precious metals this year, you could set your watch by it. Okay. Moving on. AMC. Again, a rough couple of days, a rough couple of weeks in AMC. It's been a two-week sell-off. It's kind of gone the way of the market. Um, there was an interesting article in CNBC about how AMC had, I think it was the second or the third most retail engagement on this most recent dip, that more retail traders were buying AMC than any other stock in the market, I think with the exception of Apple and AMD were the only two that were getting more retail engagement. So people definitely backed up the truck and loaded up on this dip in AMC. So there there are a lot of buyers waiting to buy this one lower. So again, I don't know if Moas is coming. I don't know if it's going to happen. All I know is if this thing goes lower, there's a lot of people waiting to buy it. And if you're short this stock, I don't know what you're waiting for. All right. So I am still, full disclosure, I am still very long AMC. It is the single largest position in my portfolio. That is not by design. Um, it's just when you when I bought AMC so low, it became the biggest position in my portfolio. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, we already talked about oil. There's one more trade. Oh, it's 406. The week is officially over. Very good. There's one more trade I want to talk about. I've, I've heard a lot of talk about natural gas recently. And again, this is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advice. Do your own research, your own DD. Arrive at a decision that's right for you based on your unique situation. Um, but this is one I bought a few years ago, uh, Chenier Energy. And I bought this one right as the Sabine Pass liquefaction facility came online. And they went from a heavily in indebted company to a LNG exporter slash cash flow positive company. And what Chenier does, they own two main facilities as well as some pipelines and other things. But they, they liquefy natural gas for shipment overseas. And if we've got what I think is coming this winter, a very cold, maybe not a very cold winter, but a very high natural gas price winter, then this is an excellent way to trade that because Chenier is able to play the arbitrage, the price difference between European natural gas and U.S. natural gas. And right now, natural gas in the U.S. is still way, way cheaper than anywhere else in the world. So this is one to keep an eye on. Again, this company has a lot of debt, but this company also has monster cash flow now. They've only recently started paying a dividend. And I think this one has some room to run. So I'm still in this one. I mentioned I was raising cash. This is not one of the positions that I'm selling. Um, I did... I had talked a few videos ago about how I was in position. Uh, I had call options in USO. I have exited that position. Um, Theta Decay forced me out. I didn't want to hold it any longer. I was getting a little close to expiration. Um, not that I don't think oil has more room to run, but at this point, I'm going to keep the cash and I am going to wait, wait it out. So, guys, that is about all I have for today. Let me see real quick. I want to check the comments again. Deflation basically means falling demand. People will end up with full warehouses full of expensive stuff that people don't want to buy. Not necess necessarily sure deflation means falling demand. All right. Deflation means a stronger dollar. And I guess if I guess falling demand could lead to inflation, maybe there's a cause effect ratio there. I don't think deflation itself would cause demand to fall. I know that's kind of what the Fed likes to say, where they're afraid of deflation because people will hold off on their spending because it might get them more tomorrow if they wait and delay purchases. I, I get that. But, you know, look, all of history, like straight up until the creation of the Federal Reserve, all of history has been deflationary. Right? I mean, just think about what it cost you to eat 5,000 years ago. 
your whole day's worth of work. You, you spent just gathering food, hunting and gathering, and then along comes technology and agriculture. And now you can actually grow enough food in a day and actually have some left over to sell for goods and services. So that's deflationary, right? The price of food has gone way down, but people's quality of life went up. And then, you know, fast forward another thousand years, and now all of a sudden you've got the Industrial Revolution. And now because of this better equipment and better tooling and better technology, now one farmer can feed a thousand people. And, well, that's deflationary, right? Now, now there's much less cost of food. Well, now you've got entire new industries have popped up and quality of life has gone way up. And now people are spending more time on leisure and art and you know, life is just getting better for people. So I don't understand this thing that the Federal Reserve has programmed into our minds that deflation should be feared and that we need to avoid deflation at all costs. All right. I think that's part of the con that these inflation muckety mucks have committed on us because they've gotten us, they've conditioned us to accept that prices just always go up. And I don't think that's true. I don't think that needs that needs to happen. The other actually the truth is the opposite. History has shown that prices always go down because we get better and we get faster and we get more efficient with time and that means prices go down. It's only since 1971, or if you want to go back further, 1913, or whenever they started the Federal Reserve, that's when prices started going up for things. All right? and, and their story that prices have to go up for our own good, no, for their own good, prices need to go up. Because inflation serves the super wealthy. Inflation hurts the middle class, it forces most people down into poverty, and it focuses the wealth up. All right? We talk about the wealth gap in this country like tax policy is how we solve it. I'm, I'm getting political again. I'm, I'm trying to avoid that. Sound money and getting rid of this inflation, acting like inflation is just part of life. We need to get rid of that mentality. All right. I think we need to bring back deflation. I think deflation is good for us. I think deflation means our lives get better. All right. Now, if you're a businessman and you're up to your eyeballs in debt, and you sell commodities for a living, maybe deflation isn't so good for you. But if you're everybody else, if you're working class, deflation is very good for you. That means your life is getting better. And with that, guys, I am going to end this one for this week. It is 412. It is market is closed. Close of a week. The weekend is upon us. I want you guys to have a good weekend. Have lots of fun. Come back. Ready to do this again on Monday. And I want to thank you guys for your time. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget, please smash that big, beautiful, transitory like button on your way out. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Hit that notification bell. I would be forever in your debt, and it helps me to keep growing. Again, thank you to all my new members, and thank you to the folks who've been with me from the beginning. It has been so great to watch this channel grow over the last few days. And I never want to stop doing this. I want to keep doing this forever and ever and ever. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart.